Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. This is Grace Fernandez, Assistant Producer of Public Health on Call. The Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs was established to develop and research creative ways to boost the use of modern family planning around the world. Today, as the center marks its 35th birthday, Dr. Joshua Sharfstein speaks to CCP's new executive director, Deborah Fridas Lopez, about the program's continued mission to inspire and enable people around the world to make healthy choices about everything from contraception to COVID-19 to climate action. Let's listen. Deborah Freitas Lopez, you are the executive director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs. Welcome to Public Health On Call. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, I understand that the center is having a birthday this year. That's right. It's our 35th. So that's a, that's a pretty big birthday, and it's a pretty big center. How many people are at the center uh, at Johns Hopkins? Yes. So overall, across the United States and the rest of the world, we're about 700 team members. 700 team members right now working in how many countries? In about 40 countries all over uh, every region. So the LAC region, Latin American and the Caribbean, um, Africa, Asia. And we've done in the past the Middle East, but not right now. Never Antarctica. Never Antarctica. <laughs> There's always room for expansion. Yeah. Oh, and I can't, I can't forget to add also that we work domestically. So we actually have programs here in Baltimore. Would it be fair to say that the Center for Communication Programs is best known for its work in social and behavior change? Yes. And it's been like that for, since the beginning when we started working in family planning and reproductive health programs. Great. I want to start with a basic question, though. Okay. What is social and behavior change? Yeah, so social and behavior change aims to empower individuals and communities and to adopt ideal behaviors related to health or other areas. So simply that maybe, maybe like stop smoking or brush your teeth twice a day? Maybe, yes. It could also be like when to seek care if your child has a fever or when to adopt family planning methods like contraceptives and, and so forth, or when to get tested for malaria or tuberculosis or something of that nature. Now, some people who are listening might think you need 700 people to do that. You know, if you're, yeah. why not just write it down and give it to people what you think they should do to improve right. their health? But I know that the center is involved in a lot more than just talking at people about what they should do. That's right. So communication is two-way or multifaceted, right? And people are complex and the systems that we live in are complex. So is society. So you, we need to do much more than just uh, print letters in a document and share it with people. We need to have them be involved in what we're doing we need to you know, invite and work alongside people to make sure that what we're creating in terms of interventions and messages and approaches stay true to what their cultures are, um, what their beliefs are, what their perspectives are, and that we're not just telling people this is what they need to do. It works better when you have people help you solve their problems as, as a partnership, as a collaborative effort. I wonder if we could talk about an example. Is there, yeah. uh, I don't know, one that may come to my mind would be like malaria mm -hmm. and protecting people, including children from malaria. Sure. Using, say, bed nets. Right. So let's say there's a country that is worried that even though they may have access to bed nets, people aren't using them. Right. Would that be the kind of thing where they might call the Center for Communication Programs and say, would you come work with us to try to address that? Yes. And then we would go in and work with the communities and also the government 
to see why people are not using the bed nets, right? Or if they're picking them up, would they use them if they were for free? Would they use them if they were more accessible? Why are they not using it? Is it because there's only one bed net for the whole family? Is there a preference for a specific gender to be under the bed net versus another? Who's making the decisions at home? And so all those pieces come into us working with communities and the government to make a plan of interventions, activities, and in a way to approach the behavior that we're aiming for, right, which is to have kids sleep under bed nets. And you're checking to see whether the project is working. Yes, And that would be like our team. We have a team of uh, research and evaluation experts uh, also that are part of CCP. And their whole focus is to make sure what we're doing is correct. And if there needs to be some adaptation made to the work that we're doing, it comes through through the research that they're doing. Um, They also research uh, behavioral science in terms of studies. And that also feeds into the work that we do. Got it. Now, I didn't tell you this before we sat down for this podcast, but I have some personal experience with the Center for Communications Programs right here in Baltimore. Okay. Um, And I was the health commissioner of the city um, during a time when infant mortality was increasing substantially. Yeah. Despite all the best efforts of the city. And at the time, we had a big focus on back to sleep, trying to uh, help parents put their kids back to sleep, which is the safest Mm -hmm. in, in cribs that didn't have other stuff in it that could cause asphyxiation. And we call it the ABCs of of safe sleep, alone, back, crib. Okay. And we were failing. And in part, we were failing because we were just sending the message as much as we could, particularly through the healthcare system. So we trained all of the nurses in the birthing hospitals. We gave onesies that said, if I'm sleeping, turn me over, which we thought were really cute to every baby born in Baltimore City, but it wasn't having an impact. In fact, one of the things that I did as the health commissioner is I wrote a letter every time a baby died from unsafe sleep to the birthing hospital. And I told them to use it to bring all the staff together to talk about how important it was to emphasize these educational messages for parents. And we weren't seeing progress. And that's when we brought in the Center for Communications Programs. And just like you gave the example with malaria, the first thing the team did is said, well, we have to understand from the perspective of people in Baltimore yeah. what they're thinking. That's right. And lo and behold, it turned out they didn't really remember much of anything was going on in the hospital. They just had a baby, you know, and they were making decisions about how to put their kids to sleep based on what they were hearing from family members, from neighbors. It was all happening outside the hospital. Right. It was it was a pretty important revelation. And when I remember thinking we had it all wrong in a sense. Well, I would say that maybe you had a part of it right, right? Because I think that when you're thinking about a health system, you have to think about those who are receiving the services, right? So the patients, and in this case, it would be the moms, the dads, and the baby. Uh, but you also have the providers. So you are getting a part of the the solution, right? But that other part that happens after a mom and the baby leave the hospital, it probably needed some uh, some tweaking and some attention. Yes, and there's a second half to the story, which is that the team at the center working with organizations and people here in Baltimore uh, came up with a very different kind of campaign that featured the voices of people in Baltimore, including some parents who had lost babies because of unsafe sleep. Mm -hmm. And they put together some very arresting videos, interviews that were then played in the jury selection rooms and the social service agencies on TV. And we saw that understanding about safe sleep practices went up tremendously in the city, that the behavior of putting babies to sleep alone on their back and in a crib went up. We actually had a, a big free crib program, which I think still exists it here does. in Baltimore. I saw, it on, I saw it on the subway as I was coming down. And the result of that was an 
a huge decline in the number of babies that were dying from unsafe sleep and a significant reduction in the racial disparity in infant mortality here in the city. And I, every time I tried to thank the Center for Communications Programs, the people always said it wasn't us. It was all the people that came together. But I get to tell you, I really appreciate that. Yeah, and I'll say the same thing my the team sa- said to you, which is that it wasn't us. It is a joint effort. And I think the reason that our programs are successful is that it's joint ownership, it's joint creation, and it's it's a journey that we take with those who are most impacted by the work that we're doing. And we take pride in that. We uh, embrace that part of the work that we're doing. Now, a number of your campaigns I've been reading actually involve young people. Yes. How is that different than other kinds of work that the center does? You know, in a lot of the places that we work, the youth is the largest and most growing population. And so they are the future for a lot of the countries that we work in. They're the future here. And so they think differently than we did when we were young. And in making sure that we work with them in terms of how they take in information and the fact that having a recognition that they can find information and data in different ways that we were able to find information is also important. I mean, if if the center wrote the playbook 35 years ago and tried to use it today no. with kids with their mobile phones and access to social media, then it probably wouldn't be that successful. Yeah, that we would we would probably be canceled. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? I mean, it's you know, it's it's a, just a very different world these days and information intake is larger than it was when we were younger and there's also a lot of misinformation. So as you're working alongside any group, especially youth, you also have to work with them not only to create something, but also to combat this the misconceptions, the myths, and the misinformation. We have to do that with all groups, but with youth, since they're so agile with the information that they have, it's, it's even more important. You have to use the language that they use, for yes, example. Yes, that's correct. And, um, and that's relevant to them depending on what country that they're in, right? So what works... The methods and the approaches that we use, for example, in Baltimore, may work in another country with some tweaking, but we also have to consider the different cultures, the the context of that country, even within a country like here in the United States, what works in Virginia may not work in Alaska, right? Are there particular issues you're working on with youth right now? Yes. So we were, we have several projects that we work with youth. Many of them relate to family planning and reproductive health work. And so we're really proud of that. We also have other programs that we do related to advocacy. And most recently, we were co awarded a program, a global program with International Youth Foundation funded by the United States um, Agency for International Development, USAID. It's the short name of it is Propel Youth and Gender. Hmm. And what is that about? And so it's working to, it's focused on policy change and working with youth groups and other organizations that work with youth abroad globally and uh, youth and gender specifically. And our role will be to work on advocacy, which is a part of social and behavior change, but it's also part of the, the other work that we do at CCP, which is knowledge management. And so the focus of this project in particular is the advocacy of knowledge management and policy change. So in a program like this, what will youth be advocating for? Well, it's it's focused on social inclusion. Uh, so there will be a focus on youth and gender equality around policies and guidelines at a national level across different countries that then rolls out to subnational levels. Could you um, give an example of the, the kinds of policies that young people might be advocating for as part of a project like this? Yes. So they may advocate for um, equity and um, 
fair treatment at uh, when they're seeking services for health? And what does that look like? And how do we address some of the stigma and bias that may exist when youth go alone to seek certain health services? And it could be something as simple as seeking, you know, seeking care for a fever to reproductive health and, and so forth. But it's this pushing of policies and uh, guidelines that then roll down from the national level to the subnational level. And what does that look like? I'll tell you one lesson that I learned from my work with the Center for Communications Programs, which is that we're talking about a lot more than a focus group. You know, sometimes people talk about health messaging and it's like, well, let's come up with the right words and we'll bring people together and we'll we'll see how that how they respond to it. But the work that your center does, not just in Baltimore, but all around the world, is really a partnership. It's very detailed. You really try to get to the root of the issues and then design programs with people that inspire them to do things differently. Don't just sort of try to message them to do things differently. Yeah. And I think that's why we're so successful, because we really take that extra bit of time that's needed to work with a variety of of key actors, right? And so sometimes we're pressured to only work with the government when our counterparts may know that the best way to go is to work with the communities and the individuals who are going to be greatly impacted by the work that we're doing. So we we always make sure that we're taking that time, that moment um, to be thoughtful uh, and meaningful about the work that we're doing. And I think that as a result of that, we are the most impactful and that we're globally known for that. And we take pride in that. And I would say that that's something that we do abroad as well as in the United States. I mean, a good example that you gave about uh, Baltimore be more for healthy babies. I, I mean, there's something to be said when an individual feels heard and feels that you're taking them into consideration and as you work through a problem and they're helping you solve that problem. Well, happy birthday to the Center for Thank Communication you. Programs. And it's going to be great to see all that continues to happen all around the world in partnership with communities inspired uh, and informed by all this experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very proud of where CCP is and uh, looking forward to us having more than 35 more years of success and adventures. It's really been wonderful to be a part of CCP these last few months and to be able to celebrate its 35th with the rest of the team. Public Health On Call is a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Philip Porter, Spencer Greer, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Fernandez and Shian Briscoe. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening. Thank you.